Welcome to the Freedom Pact podcast. It's an absolute honor to have you here. Thank you very much, Louis, for having me over on your Freedom Pact podcast. Very grateful to be here with you. Thank you. Awesome. So we're going to talk a bit about The Way of the Monk, this new book you've got released. But before we dive into it, for some context um, for our audience, I'd love to talk a bit about your journey. And what I love about your story is that before joining the ashram, you actually saw a bit of success in corporate life. And for some people, that is enough. That is what they see as happiness. So what was the experience like for you when you were living the corporate life and how did it make you feel? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, I think uh, growing up, I don't think my life was anything exceptional or sensational. (laughs) I was like a regular middle class boy. But one or two things I did get growing up was my life was full of love. My parents, my family grew me up with a lot of affection and love. And uh, I was surrounded by great examples. You know, people around me who were trying to kind of uh, live a life of selflessness and live a life of service to others. So it was very, uh, a very wholesome kind of a childhood with uh, affection and inspiration. And in terms of uh, success, I think, yeah, nothing exceptional or sensational again. You know, so I think I was decently good at my university, got good grades, decently good grades, uh, and then got selected for Hewlett Packard and with HP as well, good at my work. You know, so yeah, people could probably call it a successful life, you know, more settled, successful life. I think the experience was, uh, I found myself good at doing what I was doing, but I didn't find myself loving what I was doing. And I think there's two very important things there. People are very good at what they do, but they don't love it. There are people like those. There are people who love who love to do something and they're not good at it. You know, so it's very seldom that we find people who are good at something and they love it and they make that their profession. Mm. So I found myself good at uh, IT, but I didn't find myself loving it. I didn't find that experience very satisfying and fulfilling so that was my uh, corporate experience uh, good at doing what i was doing but not really happy with it not really uh, connecting to it yeah so you say you were, you grew up in a, a very good family you say you were you were almost pampered and you lived this stereotypically good life that a lot of people would say you know is is the perfect life so why did you mm-hmm. decide to enter the monastery what was your motivation from going from maybe a life that had luxuries to one with, without those luxuries, what were you looking to find? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I think taking a clue from the answer before uh, I was mentioning that, you know, I didn't find that fulfillment in my corporate job. I, Mm -hmm. I was getting a good paycheck, but not fulfilled. And I always love to say that, you know, imagine people working out there and giving like about, eight hours a day at work and for five days a week, that makes it 40 hours at work. And if you're looking at a 50 week work year with two weeks of holiday, that makes it 2000 hours at work. And if you look at working for about 45 years, that makes it 90,000 precious hours of your life at work. And I find that a very daunting number. You know, it's a huge number, I feel. And that accounts to about 10 years of your life. So I asked myself a question. Am I going to spend 90,000 hours of my life in misery, complaining that I don't like it, complaining that I'm stressed with it, complaining that it doesn't satisfy or fulfill me, but I'm getting a good paycheck. Am I going to spend my 90,000 hours doing that? You know, or should I be looking at spending my 90,000 hours that bring me satisfaction? So I found myself not fitting into uh, dealing with uh, machines. I found myself fitting into dealing with human beings who are behind the machines. So life interested me more than technology. And then the easiest way to look at life was to look at the ancient epics, the ancient wisdom that has been existing in the world and particularly in this country, India, where I grew up. 
and i knew that i would probably find answers to life related questions and learn the science behind life by turning to this ancient wisdom which could be accessed by going to a monastery or a ashram so moving from a corporate uh, job to the ashram number one was uh, trying to learn those sciences related to life and see if that was my calling you know if that would really fulfill me in terms of my work and that could make my 90000 hours meaningful purposeful and satisfying mm. so definitely i did find that in the ashram and that's when then i brought it to the world by sharing it on social media what i learned from the ashram and the second aspect to moving into the ashram was my own personal spiritual calling you know i did want to discover my own spiritual calling many in the world out there are seekers but very often we kind of shove it under the carpet being consumed by daily needs daily demands work life family life social life so much goes on in our life and therefore we kind of very easily and conveniently shove it under the carpet i thought no i don't want to do that i definitely want to look at if i could uh, you know discover myself and look at my spiritual calling as well so it was a combination of my passion and my spirituality finding my passion in what would I, what i would like to do as work and also simultaneously look at spiritual answers to my own calling so that's what made that shift from the corporate world to the ashram to the monastery yeah i love what you said there about the 90000 hours and what would you say to those people that i think especially over here in the uk anyway there's this sort of script that is written for us when we we go to school to get good grades yes. to go to university to get good grades to get a high paying job that we don't necessarily love but we all seem mm-hmm. to just conform and follow the status quo because that's what we've been taught to do do you think that Correct. conformity and following the status quo is dangerous mm-hmm. yeah i think so i think so conformity can be dangerous for two reasons number one if we just conform and do what we are not cut for there's a big risk we run of not achieving in excellence in what we do excellence only comes when we do what we are cut for right and number two is we run the risk of not living a life that's happy albert einstein said something amazing isn't it he said uh, if you have a fish a rabbit a monkey a deer all standing in a line and a queue and you judge everyone by the same standard of climbing up a tree the fish is going to live its entire life thinking that it's stupid now you don't judge a fish by the same standard if the fish decides to conform to what is socially considered success by this is the people around the fish is going to be a big time failure and a fish fish is going to be a failure on the tree not in water the fish is going to be miserable on the tree not in water a monkey is going to be a failure in the water not on the tree a monkey is going to be a be unhappy and miserable in the water not on the tree so so con conformism is about just accepting and fitting into what is socially acceptable and what is considered socially successful right basically going into the settled mode of life like you rightly said louis you know school university good grades a well paid job i don't necessarily love it but i need to do it because it's just socially considered successful so in the in the race of being socially successful we are actually being lost to our own selves and losing achieving excellence and losing achieving satisfaction both excellence comes when you do something that truly resonates with your soul happiness comes when you do something that truly resonates with your soul of course there's a very important disclaimer i need to make here as well you know there are real life financial liabilities that people have there are mortgages to pay there's sometimes serious financial emergencies in the family and there is then a need to at some point of time to conform to that model so that you have a certain sense of financial stability so it will be very i think it will be violent to say that you just follow your passion and neglect the real life needs that are there in your life i often say you can postpone following your passion but not neglect it you know 
so yes until a, until a certain point of time you may have to do a regular job and get a good paycheck so that you take care of all of our, all of your financial uh, needs and liabilities but alongside that i think there's also a great need that one doesn't neglect one's passion and keeps it going there's a possibility that when you're free from all those financial burdens that you could turn what your passion is into a career into your profession and which is when then you're not a conformist you don't give in to conformity but i think conformity is not just about profession and passion and money conformity is also about happiness people want to always kind of conform to the standards of social standards of happiness your looks what you look like your what you wear how you are on social media is so much to do with what's socially acceptable mm-hmm. so we are so much uh, we so much go by those uh, so much go by validation of what people say about us you want people to validate us and that makes us feel happy so i think that's conformism as well we need to carve our own uh, path in life and thus conformity definitely can be dangerous i feel yes yes on the subject of happiness is something you mentioned in your book uh the way of the monk mm-hmm. the four steps to peace purpose and lasting happiness and this i this yes. idea that happiness resides in the soul and it doesn't exist in in the materialistic uh things in life they are almost just little bonuses could you go in mm-hmm. um a bit deeper on what you mean when you say that happiness res- resides in the soul what is happiness great i would look at uh, the entire concept on three different levels you know there's three different words there one is happiness second is satisfaction and the third is bliss or joy okay and in in the indian tradition and the tradition that i belong to my particular faith we have three different words for it in sanskrit the word suk stands for happiness the word santosh stands for satisfaction and the word anand stands for bliss let me clarify what i mean you know the first obviously is happiness and i think when we talk about the word happiness we're talking about being dependent or something or someone outside of us to get that pleasure feeling correct okay. for example a student depends on his or her ranks or grades at university to feel great or a guy depends on his girlfriend or a girl depends on her boyfriend to make him or her feel good we depend on things and people outside of us so we give the remote control of our happiness in their hands they are meant to make us feel good my achievements are meant to make me feel good my things are meant to make me feel good people around me are make, meant to make me feel good basically in that word suk or happiness i do not take the responsibility or the onus of my feelings and my experience on myself you know so that's happiness but the problem with that is because we are dependent on something outside of us we are actually sowing the seed for disappointment as well because one day the grades are great another day the grades are not great one day the girl prince says you are good the other day she kind of completely calls calls you rubbish you know calls you rubbish you know one day the things are working great another day things don't work great you buy a great phone and in a couple of months well fine it's just a phone right the excitement is there so the more you depend on things or people outside of you you're actually sowing a seed of for disappointment because you could be disappointed with people and things they may disappoint you now the second is satisfaction or santosh which is something much deeper than happiness it doesn't depend on anything external it depends in self expression let me give you an example a student at university uh, is studying not because he or she is interested so much in the grades but because he or she wants to really understand the subject the satisfaction of learning is not dependent on grades so people who learn at university feel a deeper sense of satisfaction right? that's called santosh even at work if you simply dependent on a promotion at work or a good business deal being struck or a great thick fat paycheck the day doesn't come or the job's taken away from you right? but if that's your dependence 
then you're hurt, you're disappointed. Satisfaction doesn't come from your external achievements or promotions or paychecks. It comes from your self-expression. You work to express, not to impress. You know, you express yourself so fully, you find your, for yourself such an incredible space that whether or not this comes, I've derived my satisfaction fully out of self-expression and the consequence will obviously be the paycheck. I'm not uh, undermining the importance of the paycheck. You know, relationships. If I'm so dependent on the person in front of me, whom I'm in relationship, whom I'm in a relationship with, th their lack of reciprocation could disappoint me. Okay? But if I am in the mode of giving to them, there's not much they can do to disappoint me because I I really connected to that person so that I could give, I could share, I could serve. Not to say that you shouldn't get reciprocation. That's not the point. I'm only saying that when you're in that mindset you're not going to be easily disappointed and giving satisfies you more than taking. So that's called santosh or satisfaction, correct? Right? And then the third one is called anand or a very deeper sense of joy, which is where I mentioned in the book that happiness resides in your soul and not just in possessions. That's a very spiritual level of your experience and feeling where you now discover your soul. You connect very deeply to your own self. You connect to powers beyond you. You know, and when you make that deep sense of connection, that is where you find that fulfillment inside. So there are three different things. And I think all three have a place in life. We cannot say that because I'm looking for that spiritual joy or I'm looking for satisfaction from self-expression. So I don't need possessions or I don't need people. I don't need to connect to people, you know. So happiness also has its place in life. The only problem with it is, that I've given the control to something or someone else. And so there's a seed for disappointment. So in happiness, the control is in someone or something else's hand. In satisfaction, the control is in my hand. Correct. Because I'm expressing myself. But in deep joy and bliss, the, the, the control is neither in the hands of others, nor in my own hands. I now give that control to the path that I'm seeking. So nobody is defining it for me, nor am I defining it for myself. I seek a spiritual path and that path defines that experience for me. Does that make sense? So these are the yeah. three different words. Oh, it's beautiful. Sukha, Santosh, and Anand. Yeah. Beautiful. Another thing that you mentioned in the book and seems to go hand in hand with happiness when you listen to a lot of people in the personal development space is this idea of gratitude. And you describe it as mm -hmm. not a feeling, but a way of life. Why is Correct. living with gratitude so important and what can it do for us if we fully choose to embrace it? Mm -hmm. uh, I think when we're talking about positive emotions, gratitude being one, positive emotions have tremendous potency and power to infuse our physical systems physical systems with healthy hormones, correct? So you will have papers from Harvard and papers from Yale and papers from Ivy League universities, papers from renowned scientists and psychologists who would tell us that when we live in a positive state of mind, it affects our physical health as well because it infuses our system with uh, those, those uh, happiness hormones, right? Now, more than that, more than that, when we are talking about positive emotions, in particular gratitude, we are talking about experiencing true joy and true fulfillment. Like I always say, it's not the happy people who are grateful. It's the grateful people who are happy. Now, it's grateful people who experience happiness. Now I'm using the word happiness. Let's not go back to the happiness and the satisfaction, <laughs> you know, the bliss kind of terminology. Just using the common word happiness, right? Uh, so I think uh, what what gratitude does is it uh, it it impels us, it pushes us, it inspires us to start looking at our blessings. And only when we start looking at our blessings, only when we start looking at the good things that are happening in our lives, only when we start looking at the positive things that are happening in our lives, that's when the experience of life is the most fulfilling. 
otherwise the nature of the mind is to tend to look at the negative with people our mind naturally gravitates towards the faults with life our mind naturally gravitates towards looking at what the issues and the problems are in the way of the monk i talk about how i went to my spiritual teacher radhanath swami and i went to him and i was complaining to him about all the wrong things that were happening in the ashram you know and for 45 minutes i went on raving and ranting you know just complaining about all the nonsense that was going on about all the mistakes that were happening the blunders that were committed and he gave me a patient here he heard me out for 45 minutes and after 45 minutes he said to me are you done i said dear yeah. he said and can i speak now i said dear yeah. after that he said to me okay now can i say something I said, please and then my spiritual teacher for the next 45 minutes he brought my attention to all the good things that were happening in the monastery that were happening in the ashram as well now it was amazing that every single thing he had said was true it was happening all the positive and the good things were happening right around me the problem was my mind was so consumed by looking at the negatives that uh, i wasn't able to see the positive so then of course he spent enough time with me also explaining to me how we could deal with these issues and then he told me you know what the problem is not the problem the problem is that your mind is consumed by the problem the problem is going to be there the problem is not so much the problem the problem is that your mind is consumed by the problem and when your mind is consumed by the problem there's an issue there not only you lose your joy and satisfaction but you also lose the ability to effectively deal with your problem a mind that's deeply absorbed in negativity loses the ability to deal with the problem effectively so he said which is why we need to be consumed with positivity and deal with negativity often we just get consumed by negativity and we forget the positivity now after i spoke to him i went to take lunch and uh, uh, i came back to my room and i was preparing for my talk and i was wondering what the theme for my talk that evening be and suddenly i found there was something stuck in my tooth it was a cumin seed and my tongue was constantly going to the cumin seed in that tooth i tried dental floss i tried you know gargling nothing worked finally i took an interdental brush and there we go the cumin seed was removed and i found the theme for my talk the cumin seed in my tooth and the advice of my teacher <laughs> and i i i that evening i gave this analogy that when a cumin seed stuck in our tooth the tongue tends to constantly go to that seed but there's 31 other teeth in the mouth when nothing stuck where the tongue could go and say hey look there's nothing here hey look there's nothing here but the tendency of the tongue is to be obsessed with something stuck in the tooth and it needs to be dealt with obviously it needs to be taken up correct right? but it's not just the tongue it's the mind as well lewis the tendency of the mind is as well as to go to the negatives to things where where, where you know we find ourselves stuck but gratitude inspires us pushes us impels us to shift our focus shift our attention to the positives to the blessings to the good that's happening in life not neglecting the bad or the problems but with that positive energy deal with that effectively so i think gratitude not only makes us happy not only does it infuse our uh, bodies with the positive hormones which give us good physical health as well it also makes us effective in dealing with the issues and the problems that we face mm. yeah. i think the world is moving so fast these days um so if i you know if i'm hungry i can tap a few buttons on my phone and food is at my door in 30 minutes um you know if if there's something i want if there's a possession i want i can go online it'll be at my house the next day um yes. i think even through social media that our social connections is you know i can go on my friends instagram and i can see his life in a in an instagram story in his 10 second snippets everything is just moving so fast in our generation at the moment 
Why do you think it is important to slow down when we can? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think number one, we need to slow down. But firstly, I think uh, technology is great and it can make our life very efficient. It can make our life uh, comfortable. It can make our life convenient and nothing wrong with technology. It's just that how we use technology sometimes that can harm us, right? And how then technology can get toxic in our lives. So uh, number one reason why we need to slow down is because we need to work on ourselves. When we are in a very fast paced life, we very conveniently forget to work on ourselves. We work on our work. We work on our social media growing our social media connection. We work on uh, everything else except our own selves. And the one thing I always love to say is you cannot pour from an empty jug. If your jug is empty, what are we going to give others? What are we, how effective would we be in what we do? If my oxygen mask is not in place on a flight when there's a, a low oxygen level in the cabin, how am I going to put the oxygen mask on somebody else? So the cabin crew members will make an announcement that make sure that your oxygen mask is securely fastened before you help children, infants, or others sitting next to you. So number one reason to slow down is because life is not about rushing alone. We need to rush, definitely. We need to hustle, definitely. We need to get there, definitely. But life is not all about just hustling, grinding, and rushing. Life is about living. And in order to live your life, you need to slow down. Right? You need to slow down. And I'm not saying slow down as you don't do these other things. It just means giving a priority to your own self, unwinding, working on yourself. You know, that's number one, to live a life by working on yourself. You need to slow down. Number two is uh, particularly in terms of our profession, but even in terms of our relationships, is if you don't slow down, you don't refine your process. When you're simply rushing, you're just getting things done. When you actually give something time, you start refining the quality of what you do. Yesterday, I was sitting with a friend and I was uh, suggesting to him that he should listen to a particular song that I heard. I, was, I really loved the song, so I, I sent him a link. So he, he copied that link uh, or into his browser, into Safari on his phone. And uh, I think he copied it on YouTube and then he started listening to it. And I just didn't find the song right. I heard in my room and it was so beautiful. Such a beautiful song and it just didn't sound right. Uh, I thought, so, I, I thought maybe, this, maybe I didn't get it right and this is how it is. And then he said, uh, I think it's not sounding right. And he realized that the YouTube, the speed setting on YouTube, was 2x. So we were listening to the song at 2x. The, all the subtle nuances, you know, the finesse in that song was absolutely ruined because it was played at 2x, such a high speed, whereas it's not meant to be heard that way. So then I felt, you know, when you have all the subtleties in the process, you miss those subtleties when you're, at a, you're living your life at a fast pace, even your, in your relationships. We need to sit down, spend time, quality time. If we're just rushing and hushing all the time, how are you going to make a meaningful bonding with the person you are meant to connect to, right? And therefore, number two is to really refine the process. Bring in those subtleties into the process, which really bring you to that success in whatever area of life we are talking about. And number three is relishing life itself. In the book, The Way of the Monk, I talk about the story of Joshua Bell. Joshua Bell was such a renowned violinist. You know, His violin cost, the, the price of his violin was three and a half million dollars. Now that's an expensive, expensive violin, three and a half million dollars. And every single time he performed, the auditoriums, the theaters would be jam-packed with people. People would pay 100, 200, 250 dollars to attend his concerts and he would play all of this classic masterpieces, you know. And then Washington Post on January 12th, 2007 decided to do an experiment 
where they put Joshua Bell in one of the subway stations in Washington, you know. And guess what? They were just trying to see, they had put cameras to see how many people actually stop and listen to him. Just a couple of weeks before that, he had filled up halls and sold out massive, you know, concerts. And here was Joshua Bell performing for free, the best violinist in the world, giving you a free concert, playing the best masterpieces you could ever imagine. And guess what? Seven people stood there and heard. Guess what? 27 people put some money in the hat in front of it, which accounted to $32. Whereas one, one ticket sells for $200, $250. And 1,070 people had just walked by, you know, slurping some coffee and munching on their donuts in the morning hours. Of course, I have written in the book the details of this case study. People who are watching can read it. But our life has become so fast-paced that a spectacle could be happening around us. But that fast-paced life, you know, makes us bereft of the experience of the spectacle that's happening right around us. You know, and therefore it's not just about fast and fancy. It's about slow and simple as well. Mm -hmm. Some of the most amazing experiences of life come in those silent moments, in those slow moments, when you just give yourself that time. So these are the three things I would say, Lewis. Number one would be that, you know, we need to relish our life. You know, like I said, the example of Joshua Bell. Number two is, of course, to refine the process of what we are doing to give attention to those uh, subtle nuances of what we are doing and uh, of course uh, if we are just going in a fast paced life i don't think we are getting anywhere so i think those are the things we need to push i think i think music is a, a perfect metaphor for that i heard a saying once that the the beauty of music and the the melody of music actually exists in the empty space between the notes rather than the notes really? themselves. Yeah, yeah. Amazing. I don't know if you've heard this poem. I don't know who said it, who wrote I can't remember the poet's name now, but I studied it when I was in school. What is this life? It's full of care. We have no time to stand and stare. No stand, mm. to, no time to stand beneath the boughs and stare at the field and the cows, something to that effect. But what is this life? It's full of care. We have no time to stand and stare. I, I just remember the line of the poet. Beautiful. We talked about slowing down. What mm -hmm. advice would you give to those people who maybe know the benefits of meditation, but they don't know where to start? And I think for, for someone like me, um, mm -hmm. it would be silly to go straight in and think I could meditate like a monk straight away. Um, so for mm -hmm. those who don't know where to start, where do you think would be the best place to start the journey of meditation? Okay. I think I look at meditation from two different points of view. Number one is the process of meditation. Meditation as a process. And second is meditation as a practice. So when we're talking about meditation as a process, it's about a technique that we need to learn, obviously. And for people who don't meditate yet can... Uh, Begin with maybe download an app. There's so many apps available on your phones. You can probably take an online course or if there be a meditation coach or a guru or a master, go to them and learn. But definitely take it slow and easy. You know, we, we need to just uh, go bit by bit and reach there slowly. So that's the process of meditation. But when I uh, talk about the second aspect, which is the practice of meditation, to me, practice is not about a technique. To me, practice of meditation is about a lifestyle. Mm. You know, we can be actually practicing meditation in the way we live, for which we don't need an app, for which we don't need to uh, go to a guru or a master or a teacher or a coach, for which we don't need an online course. We can start adopting the practice of meditation in our daily lifestyle. Uh, here's what I mean. In my personal life, I decided that at a certain point of time that I was going to take one meal a day simply to just by myself. And the reason was I wanted to be completely present in the experience of savoring that meal. 
We're so often we are distracted with smartphone when we're eating or watching a television show while we're eating or reading a book while we're eating or chatting with someone while we're eating. So what we are doing is we are getting distracted from that one point of savoring the experience of eating, eating being one example, meal being one example, right? So mindfulness is the art of learning to tune into the present moment, being completely focused in the present moment, right? Now, when you start adopting the technique of meditation, this is going to be the greatest challenge. The mind just won't focus. Right. The mind just won't come to that one point where you're meant to focus. But what if we adopted this lifestyle that we start doing what we do by being present and tune into the power of now? Small things are extremely powerful. They are meditations by themselves. You know, I think eating is a meditation by himself, itself. Talking to somebody is a meditation by itself. And to learn to be present in it. Reading is a book is a meditation by itself to be, to be present in it, not having a phone by the side where we get distracted as we are reading. Okay. So just taking our attention away in all different directions. So I feel this lifestyle, adopting this lifestyle is a meditation by itself. And we don't have to wait to do this. We can start being more present in what we are doing. And it's a practice. If we, if we adopt it, it's not going to happen overnight, obviously. But bit by bit, we can get there. So we have meditation as a process, a technique, and then we have meditation as a practice, the lifestyle. And both go hand in hand, I think. You have built up a very impressive social media platform, um, and you're now reaching the, the mainstream world with your message. For you, is this a form of being of service to the world? Yes, I think so. Absolutely. Because uh, whatever we do, we are meant to be giving back, serving, you know, making a difference in the world out there. Uh, and for me, it's sharing this wisdom that I learned in the 25 years of being in the monastery, being in the ashram. Like Howard Schultz said something very nice, the vision of Starbucks. He said, we are not in the coffee business serving people. We are in the people business serving coffee. Wow. Correct. So whatever we do, we are in the people business. We are wanting to make a difference through whatever our product is. For Starbucks, the product's coffee. For me, the product's wisdom. But whatever the product may be, we are meant to make a difference in the lives of people, a positive difference in the lives of people. So I do feel that it's my service to the world. And it could be a commercial or a non-commercial enterprise, obviously. Starbucks is a commercial enterprise, but they're making a difference to people. The cafe culture, where people, they started it. The people could come hang out, pick up a cup of coffee and sit, use Wi-Fi, chat endlessly. They started it, made a difference to the youngsters in particular. Correct? Mine may be a non-commercial enterprise, but whether commercial or non-commercial, it's about making a difference to people. So it's a service to people, yes. Last weekend, I was in a, a bookstore um, in my local mm -hmm. town and I noticed a book that I'd heard through um another podcast i listened to with a with a monk and the book is mm -hmm. called um, excuse my pronunciation the bhagavad mm -hmm. gita what can yeah. that book offer us even to those people who aren't seeking a religious aspect from the book mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. if i read the book which i haven't yet i was thinking about picking it up what could it offer me? what lessons could it teach me mm -hmm. uh, i always love to say that the bhagavad gita is uh, not a book of religion anyways. Although it has a religion jar religious jargon there because it's spoken in a certain context. But uh, the Bhagavad Gita is a way of life. And in terms of what could it offer to a reader, I think all of us go through a lot of emotional turmoil. It could be because of a heartbreak. It could be because of an emotional letdown. It could be because of a financial crisis. It could be because of a pandemic that is affecting all of us. It could be because of politics at our workplace. It could be because of losing our jobs. It could be because of a mortgage that we're not able to pay, but there's so much going on in life that affects our minds a lot. Our mental space is so much occupied by stuff that bothers us a lot. Our mental space is meant to be free for things that are of value, but a lot of rubbish occupies our mental space for valid reasons, because we live in the real world and there are real issues that we face, correct? 
Now, with all of this going on, very often we feel helpless and overwhelmed. Our emotions take over. Uh, that's when we get into unhealthy states of our mental health. You know, that's when we could go into states of chronic depression. We could feel lost. We could, uh, we could have mood swings because there's so much going on inside, right? Now, when emotions take over, negative emotions take over, we lose our ability to see with clarity. Negative emotions cloud our vision. Negative emotions cloud our ability to think in a crisp and a candid way, right? So books like the Bhagavad Gita sharpen our intellect. They give us the vision to see through all the negative, ne negativity that we go through, in which case we are then able to see with clarity and based on that clarity, we are able to now make our decisions which are well-informed, deliberated over, and not impulsive springing from those negative emotions. So the character of the Bhagavad Gita, a gentleman named Arjun, who is a warrior, uh, is meant to fight a battle on this battlefield. And suddenly he finds himself clouded by negative emotions because he sees people who are very dear to him standing on the other side against whom he has to fight. And when he goes through this massive emotional crisis, he finds himself extremely helpless and overwhelmed. It's then that he turns to his chariot driver, Shri Krishna, who happens to be his friend, but now takes on the role of a mentor. And it is based on the guidance that Shri Krishna gives to Arjun that he comes out of this entire state and now becomes responsible to fight on the battlefield. So this conversation between Krishna and Arjun is what the Gita, Bhagavad Gita is. Something that helps us think with clarity and make well-informed and well-transformed and deliberated decisions. And on the subject of books, I have to ask you, what books uh -huh. other than that have you read in your life that had a, have had a massive impact on you that you could recommend our audience check out? Okay. Uh, Another book from India itself, again, is the book called the Mahabharat, you know, okay. and the Mahabharat is a book in which the Bhagavad Gita appears. So if one has to understand the Gita, and the, it's a great thing to read the Mahabharat. And uh, there's an English translation of this available. It's by a gentleman called Krishna Dharma. It's a great translation, the Mahabharat by Krishna Dharma. I also uh, felt very deeply moved by the book that my spiritual teacher uh, Radhanath Swami wrote, it's called The Journey Home. It's his journey from Chicago to India in search for meaning, purpose and fulfillment. So I love that book as well. I also recommend a book called Personality Profiles by Robert Rom. Uh, a lot of people in the UK refer to this model called the DISC model of personality profiling. And it's based on that book. So it's a great book to find yourself uh, a new personality from that book as well so some names there amazing i have two questions left for you um the mm -hmm. first one is if we imagine a scenario in which every person on the planet is tuned into the same frequency and you are given the opportunity to just broadcast one message or lesson that you would love every person in the world to hear or learn what would your one message be uh -huh. Uh, we live, Lewis, in a world which is so externally connected today. So externally connected because of technology. Mm. We're sitting in London, I suppose. Right? Um, Wales, and, so in the UK, yeah. Wales. Oh, you're in the Wales. Okay. So you're in Wales and I'm here in Mumbai and we are doing this podcast together. Correct. We are so technologically connected. And particularly in the world today, social media is like a thing that people consider so serious. They have to post everything that they do, what they look like, what they eat, where they are, whom they are hanging out with, what movie they watch. And everybody has to make an opinion, correct? So I think what's happening is we live a life uh, in, in trying to get the like shares and comments in the external world so much that it seems that very often we can go very far away from our own self. So my one message would be that 
there's nothing wrong with social media and there's nothing wrong with posting and there's nothing wrong with like shares and comments and there's nothing long wrong with our external life let's not live an external life at the cost of our internal life let's not get so close to everything and everyone else that we will come very far from our own selves right so i think we definitely need to pay attention to our inner selves as well amazing my last question for you is for you personally what makes a life worth living Mm-hmm. For me, a life worth living would be a life full of love, a life full of meaning, mm-hmm. a life which is useful to others, and a life which has no regrets. Yeah. That's a life for me that's worth living, Louis. Amazing! Thank you so much for bringing so much value to the podcast today. It has been one of my oh, favorite you, conversations. Louis. So. Um, Thank you oh, very much. Very kind, very kind. Keep the good work going and wish you all the very best. And my sincere gratitude uh, that you invited me over on your podcast. Such a pleasure speaking to you.